First World War, as German U-boats began attacking Allied shipping, the British Admiralty sought ways to deal with the submerged threats. One of the ways they thought to combat the threat of U-boats was through tricking a submarine into thinking it was attacking a myriad of different ships, such as small freighters, tramp steamers, motor drifters, or even sailing vessels crossing the ocean unarmed. Typically, early on in the conflict, a U-boat captain upon seeing such a vessel would abandon the safety of the deep and rise to the surface in order to approach the vessel and sink it, either by gunfire or by explosives placed on the vessel. In reality, these Q ships, as they would come to be known, would have expertly concealed armaments crewed by Royal Navy sailors posing as merchant sailors, and through the combination of their concealed arms and a bit of acting on the crew's part, they would lure a U-boat in close enough to destroy it. The idea of the Q ships would appeal to the mind of the First Lord of the Admiralty, Winston Churchill, who had several vessels fitted out in the winter of 1914 to 1915. These first Q ships would see little to no success, which would lead to even more trickery when seemingly innocent trawlers flying a British flag would be secretly towing a British submarine, with a telephone wire going from the trawler to the submarine in order to communicate between the two. Once the trawler would spot a U-boat, it would notify the towed submarine, who would cast off and attack the German U-boat. Several U-boats were sunk using this method, Notably, when the trawler Taran Kai, working with submarine C-24, sank U-40 in June of 1915 off Aberdeen. But, by that time, Churchill had left the Admiralty, and this combination did not survive much longer. The Q-ship concept as a whole would survive Churchill and really started to flourish. The crew, as I mentioned, would be comprised of Royal Navy officers and seamen. In this, the complement allocated to Q-ships would be around double the normal amount of officers and men aboard a normal ship of its size, and disguise themselves as civilians. Being stripped of their uniforms and dressed in rags from waterfront shops, they would let their hair and beards grow, along with regular Navy regulations becoming relaxed. No salutes were given, and sailors slouched and shuffled along the decks, hands in their pockets or smoking their pipes constantly. When it came time for action, they learned to mimic the crisis behavior of a freighter's crew, with the so-called panic party, some members of the crew would quickly abandon ship, getting into lifeboats and rowing away, sometimes even purposefully lowering one end quicker than the other, causing men to crash into the water, or seamen pretending to be the captain would be the last one on board carrying a bag that looked like the ship's papers. All the while, a U-boat captain watching this play out would surface in order to close and sink the vessel. The men still aboard would be waiting patiently with their concealed weapons, like 4-inch guns, that were placed beneath wooden bulwarks or concealed through various other means, waiting for the order from the captain to let go and raise the white ensign and collapse the false bulwarks and other concealments to reveal the guns to pour on rapid and accurate fire onto the exposed U-boat. Later, Q-ships would carry depth charges, allowing for the crew to attack the U-boat even if it was submerged. To take from Castles of Steel, Britain, Germany, and the winning of the Great War at Sea by Robert K. Massey, he writes, Q-ship duty was a unique blend of extreme danger and the dullest monotony. Back and forth through the dangerous waters steamed the ships, hoping to meet a submarine. Success in this strange service could mean seeing the white bubbles of a torpedo approaching from the port or starboard beam. Sometimes when a torpedo struck, Q-ship men would be killed, but the ship itself was unlikely to sink quickly. This was a result of further guile. Q-ship cargo holds were crammed with wood or empty oil drums to provide the vessel with additional buoyancy. As the war went on and U-boat captains became aware of the Q-ships, they became more cautious, being forced to stay beyond the range of the freighter's guns and sink them by long-range gunfire, or remain beneath the surface and fire torpedoes at the Q-ship, meaning that the acting of the crew would have to get even better to convince the U-boats that they really were a helpless merchant vessel. A man who became an expert at Q-ship warfare was one Gordon Campbell. During the First World War, 12 U-boats would be sunk by Q-ships, Three of these would be sunk by Campbell and his crews. When the First World War began, Campbell was a 30-year-old lieutenant commander in charge of an old destroyer. He went to Q ships where his nerves of steel and determination to sink U-boats resulted in some truly impressive feats. On his first Q ship, it would be several months before he would spot his first opponent, U-68, which he sank on March 22, 1916. And then on February 17, 1917, on another Q ship, HMS Fanborough, he sank U-83, wherein Campbell was awarded with the Victoria Cross, with the citation explaining that the circumstances could not be made public, and it became known as the Mystery VC. 
His final triumph would be aboard Paragust on June 17, 1917, when the submarine mine layer UC-29 was sunk by gunfire, with the crew being awarded two Victoria Crosses for their bravery, being awarded to one officer and one seaman, chosen by a secret ballot of their peers. Now, these individual actions could all be their own videos and will be at some point. However, the action I want to discuss is the battle between the 3,000-ton HMS Dunraven and U-61, or UC-71. Now, to be transparent, when it comes to this battle, I will be referring to the U-boat in this engagement as U-boat. Do note that there are conflicting sources out there which state the battle was fought between Dunraven and UC-71, or like in Castles of Steel, between Dunraven and U-61. Like I've said for a long time on this channel, take what I say with a grain of salt as I'm not a proper historian, and I'm trying to toe the middle ground with my conflicting sources. By the summer of 1917, Q-ships were no longer really a viable strategy, as U-boats had become much larger and their captains much more suspicious. And with their size increase, it meant that they carried more torpedoes, so it was safer for U-boat captains to torpedo merchant ships without coming to the surface. Nevertheless, on the morning of August the 8th, 1917, HMS Dunraven, commanded by Campbell, was going through the Bay of Biscay, offering herself up to submarine attack, acting as an armed merchant cruiser with a small gun visible on her stern. Dunraven also concealed four heavier guns, two underwater torpedo tubes, and four depth charges. At 11 a.m., a surfaced U-boat was spotted on the horizon, and apparently had seen Dunraven as it turned in her direction and submerged. Campbell, being rather experienced by this point, played the part of the victim, with indifferent zigzags and ordered heavy funnel smoke to appear that he was trying to make an escape. Instead, he was reducing speed to allow his enemy to close, and at around 11.45, the U-boat rose from the sea, less than two miles away, and began firing at Dunraven with her deck gun. A shell would land in the water near the engine room. Campbell would order the release of a huge cloud of steam to suggest that a boiler had been hit, being done through specially installed pipes designed to release steam at the captain's command. Meanwhile, the crew would continue to play the role of a tormented armed merchantman, returning the fire of the U-boat with the unconcealed stern gun, and radioing loudly on an open frequency their cries for help, for all to hear, especially the U-boat. At 12.25pm, when the U-boat was just about half a mile away, Campbell ordered his men to abandon ship and turn the ship broadside so the U-boat could see the performance of the crew. The panicked crew threw themselves into lifeboats, with one being mishandled whilst being lowered and left behind hanging vertically from its davits. Encouraged by what he was seeing, the captain of the U-boat cautiously brought his ship in closer while keeping up his fire. During this time, a shell would strike Dunraven's stern amid guns, ammunition, depth charges, and men. A depth charge would explode, tossing the small gun on the stern into the air. Two more shells would land on the stern, producing more smoke and flames. With the ammunition and depth charges being in the rear, it was almost certain that another larger explosion would soon come. Even with that threat, the crew of the secret 4-inch gun remained motionless. The U-boat at this point was less than 500 yards away, as it passed around the stern from port to starboard. Due to the smoke, it made it almost impossible for the British gunners to aim. Campbell chose to wait until there was an unobstructed view of the U-boat. In this downtime, two depth charges exploded, and the concealed 4-inch gun and its crew were thrown about the decks of the Q-ship. Due to the size of the explosion, the U-boat was now warned that it was facing a Q-ship, and crashed dove and disappeared. Even with his crippled, stationary ship, and now with the torpedo attack certain, Campbell was still intent on sinking his enemy, and radioed that all potential assistance should keep away. At 1.20pm, a torpedo struck Dunraven's starboard side. Another impromptu panic party abandoned the ship and went over the side and rafts, hoping to convince the U-boat captain that now his opponent was sinking. However, the men of the remaining concealed guns and two submerged torpedo tubes, along with the ship's doctor, nine wounded men, and four men on the bridge, including Campbell, were still on board, waiting for their chance to strike. The U-boat rose once more, and uncertain that her burning and listing opponent was actually abandoned, fired several more shells into her, then submerged again. For the next 45 minutes, the U-boat circled at periscope depth, watching her burning and listing victim. Dunraven continued to have explosions, making her condition even worse. Finally, at 2.30pm, the U-boat surfaced astern of Dunraven and shelled her for 20 more minutes, and the crew aboard remained motionless. At 2.50, the U-boat ceased fire and moved past Dunraven at a distance of only 150 yards. Campbell, deciding that this was his time to strike, 
ordered a torpedo fired at 2.55 p.m., but due to the list, the aim of the torpedo was not true. Fortunately, the U-boat, unaware, came around the starboard side, and Dunraven fired a second torpedo, and this time a large metallic clang could be heard. The torpedo had struck home, but failed to detonate. The U-boat captain heard the noise and decided to dive deep into the ocean and return to Germany. Campbell would now signal for help, and soon an American armed yacht along with two British destroyers arrived to rescue the crew. Dunraven herself would be taken in tow, and later went down that night due to the damage she sustained in the battle. Two crewmen were awarded Victoria Crosses, a lieutenant and a petty officer. And Gordon Campbell was given a bar to his Victoria Cross, along with that, he had a distinguished service order with two bars, making him the most highly decorated man in the Royal Navy during the Great War. Thank you all for watching, I hope you've enjoyed this interesting story. Please remember to like and subscribe as it will help the channel to grow. And until next time my friends, have a great week and good luck.